Okay, so let's start. Uh, before we continue the material, there is a final announcement for the week. So if you have seen on Avenue, uh, information about two review sessions has been posted. So please check it out. Do not forget that the deadline for submitting uh, an alternative re uh, test uh, request is tomorrow at noon, if you have conflict with another schedule. But well, today we will start a new topic. Although before that, we will finalize these applications of exponential cell logs, and what we'll have is the logistic function, which has some applications in population biology, etc. But, well, if you have not seen a logistic function, the form that this has is a function q of t equal to the quotient of b divided by 1 plus a times e minus b k t, where a, b, and k are positive constants. We will do some, um, we'll provide some elements in order to indicate what is the shape of this plot. Um, and just to indicate some possible applications, it is important in population models where you have the concept of carrying capacity or epidemics. So, as you remember, we need the information of the derivative, second derivative, etc., etc., in order to figure out the shape of the function. Um, another way in which you can write Q of t is simply b times the inverse of 1 plus AE minus BKT, so this is inverse, to the minus one power. So now what I will do is to present some info for sketching Q of T. And the first information, well, usually T, the argument, is greater or equal to zero, because this has interpretation of time. Um, so you have an initial time and then you look at the evolution of this function for further times. And the first info that you will have is the derivative, right? So if you were, actually this form is convenient in order to do that. So, well, if you apply your derivation rules, okay, you'd have the denominator squared, then minus b, and then the derivative of what is inside. So. The minus came from this one, so this is the minus two. Then you have minus b k a e minus b k t. So this stands for the derivative of this argument. If you factorize what you have, this is equal b squared k a e minus b k t divided by the quotient of one plus a e minus b kt squared. Now, there is an important thing to mention, which is, if you look at the result for the derivative, all the quantities are positive, right? So the constants are positive by assumption. You have b squared, two. you have e minus b kt. Exponential is always positive, and then you have this quotient. So that is good to know, because the fact that the derivative is positive means that q is an increasing function. So that's an important piece of information, right? Look, the computation for the second derivative is actually, will, would take some time. I have the actual computation in the notes, which I will upload after the class. So you can check the detailed steps of the computation. So I will just present the result, but you can check all the steps in the derivation in the notes after class, and if I were to do the computation, what I would have is that the second derivative is equal to AB cubed times K squared times E minus B K T times A E minus B K T minus one divided by one plus A E minus B K T cubed, okay? so. Check the notes for the steps. This is some assignment for you. 
so think about it. So now if you do a time analysis again, this is the only factor which can change time, right? So it's okay. This is positive, everything else is positive. So if you think about it, the sign of the second derivative, q double prime of t, is determined by the factor a e minus b k t minus one. Okay, this is the only thing that can change time. Please check the steps by yourself. So. The reason we compute the second derivative is because we look for possible inflection points, which again have a potential inflection point by the condition q double prime of t equal to zero. Have to verify some other stuff, but in principle, that's the first candidate. And because of what I have said, the only thing that can make the second derivative equal to zero is if that factor is zero. So that would mean, in this case, that a e minus b k t minus one, which is the factor, would be equal to zero. And then I pass to the other side, right? So e, that would imply that e minus b k t is equal to one over a. So I just pass to the other side and divide by a. a is positive by assumption, so it's not an issue. Yeah, is it okay now? Everybody, well, can everybody look perfectly at the sheet of paper now? Okay. So now we just want to derive the condition for the time in which you had the secondary relative equal to zero. So you apply the natural log, right? Let's say that you apply the natural log, then you have minus b k t equal, what? <laughs> oh, again? Oh my God. Start just moving around. <laughs> Lucky me. Does this work for everybody? So far, so good? Yeah. Okay. If there is an issue, let me know. So you apply the log on this equation, right? Then 1 over a is equal to a to the power minus 1. So you have natural log of a minus one, which by properties of the logs is minus natural log of a. So you can eliminate the minus sign. What you would have is bkt equal to natural log of a. And now you can find your time because t is equal to natural log of a divided by b times k. Right? So we have found the possible inflection point. In fact, if you do a sign analysis of this factor, which defines the... Yeah, I know. So it's either when I put the pen or when I move the page. Or... Yeah. Actually, I want to make a question because, look, there is a big difference in the quietness of the room when I use that compared to this one. What do you prefer, this document or the smart pen? This one, okay. Because the other... Wow, it doesn't stop. Look, if the issue keeps coming on because it's the first, well, the second time that it happens, I'll just resort to the smart pen and it's not an issue. 
Um, so, just to make a sign analysis, if I were to make the sign analysis of this, I have this point, natural log of A divided by BK. This is where you have your change of concavity by analysis of this factor. Because here, the second derivative would be positive. Here, it would be negative. So here, you have a region where second derivative is greater than 0. And because the derivative increases, then you have a concave pop concavity. Um, in this case, you would have f double prime less than 0 where the derivative decreases. So you have concave down. And again, the second derivative would be positive for t less than natural log of a over bk. Second derivative would be negative for values of t greater than this value. And this is precisely the condition for an inflection point. So, well, we know the function is increasing. It has an inflection point as this value. Um, of course, the value at zero, q of zero, is equal, just plugging in t equal to zero, b plus one, b divided by 1 plus a times e to the 0. So b divided by 1 plus a. And so this is the value at 0. And to finalize, if I were to present the plot, I would simply use all the information that I have, right? Well, also, if I consider the limit as t approaches infinity of q of t for this function, well, basically, the exponential thing disappears, and I would have b. So, just drawing the graph. Think about it for a sec. The function is increasing. By the way, in order, if you think about the disinflection point, realize for its sign a natural log of a. So in order for that inflection point to be positive, what you need is natural log of A greater than zero, which means that A should be, this is not commented in the textbook, but A should be greater than one in order to have that condition, okay? So, uh, so that uh, natural log of A is greater than zero. So this is the initial value, B divided by one plus A. Then you will have an inflection point, which is natural log of A divided by BK. So let's say at this point you have the inflection. So first it has a concave up shape. Then change. Is this okay? So then it changes to concave down at the inflection point. And then it has this limiting value, which is called the carrying capacity. So you have some, especially in population models, this is important because this region is sort of like an exponential population growth. And then the concavity changes and the growth is diminished. You still have a function that is increasing, but it's concave down, so the growth is not as let's say, um, as big as you would have in this other region. But look, for now, this is all that we would like to talk about when um, we study logistic functions. Um, so, okay. I will jump to the other section. So this is the first time that you will see in this course integration. But I'm pretty sure that you have seen that before. So who has seen the integral uh, before in high school? Okay. Who knows the rules of integration for a sum, a constant, etc.? So many, well. Look, if it's not the first time, don't worry. We will 
Um, We'll give the, nec the necessary information for the course. Don't worry about it. It's OK. So we jump to the next section, which is anti-differentiation, which goes to indefinite. Okay, raise your hand if you have seen this concept before. I want to know the status. Just how many? Indefinite integral or integral. Okay. So, look. If you have not seen it in high school, this is the problem. You define the concept of anti-differentiation the following way. A function, and here I would use the notation capital F of X, is said to be an antiderivative of F of X if F prime, capital F prime of X is equal to little f of X for every X. in the domain of f of x. So what is an antiderivative? You need to find a function such that its derivative is the other function. That's all, right? Perhaps here you would not see the connection, but there will be a connection between the derivative and the integral, meaning that they are inverse operators of each other when you apply it to a function. But the problem is essentially, given a function little f, you want to find another function, capital F, so that when you apply the derivative to capital F, you recover the function little f. That's all, okay? It's like a little, like an inverse problem. When, um, in the previous chapters, we had a function and we applied the derivative rules that we know. In this case, we actually want to find a function such that we would get the original by the process of taking the derivative. That's all, if you have not seen this. So, the process of finding antiderivatives is called anti-differentiation and it also has another name which is indefinite integration. So Again, notation is important, and this goes back to our point of, well, you guys in high school apparently only saw the notation of f prime. Here, we will also have the Leibniz notation again, because the equation f prime of x, capital, equal to little f of x, can be written yeah, also as df dx equal to f of x. This is just notation. I'm just introducing the same notation that I have for the derivative. Um, get used to it because, look, the reason I was very insistent on the Leibniz notation is not only for the rules of derivatives, it's also for integration. It makes the life much easier. You might not see all the integration rules, but even only for the ones that we will see in this course, the notation is helpful, okay? So just keep it in mind. Um, we will do an exercise. Which is the following. Have to verify that the following function, capital F of x, equal to x cubed over three plus five x plus two is an anti-derivative of the function little f equal x squared plus five. And so, let's remember, right? The condition on f, big F, is that when you compute f prime, big F prime, you would have 
let's do the computation, right? So this is our f. So we have three x squared divided by three because it's in the denominator, then plus five, right? So we do an elimination, x squared plus five, which is actually this function. So this is satisfying the condition that we were looking for, right? We want to find the function such that when I apply the derivative, I recover the other one, okay? Do you guys see how it works? This was just a verification because essentially we were given both functions. So we were able to verify this computation. And actually, later on what we will do is to find the integrals or antiderivatives of functions. And just to verify that all the steps were performed correctly in your calculations, it would be like a sanity check, okay? Um, Again, maybe, look, I'm asking uh, repeatedly because in high school it's usual that people have seen integration. Who has seen integration before in high school? Or did? Okay, it's not the majority. Never mind, it's okay. Um, that's okay, the, in this part the course is actually self-contained. You will never be asked more than what you're supposed to know in this course. Having said that, please remind that in the syllabus in, it's indicated that the first three chapters uh, should be known by yourself because, well, <coughs> given that the derivative and the integral are inverse operators, knowing the rules for derivatives helps for rules of integration. So if you know those, you are a step ahead in any case. So what you have is general antiderivative of a function, there is something that I'm missing to say. So at this point, what I did was to verify a calculation, but is there a question? Pardon? I'm more than happy to answer questions, it's not an issue. We still need to make a clarification though. Is the focus on focus thing still like playing with your mind or? Is it okay? Okay. So, in general, if big F is one antiderivative of little f, then so is any function of the form g of x equal to big F plus a constant c. So let's say that c is constant. And why is that so? And actually, this is something that I got a question from somebody. What is the derivative of a constant function? This is something that you probably know. The derivative of a constant? Zero, right? Okay. So what this is telling you is that you can actually propose another candidate for the antiderivative, which is the same function that you had was a constant. Because when you apply the derivative, it won't matter. It will disappear. The derivative of a constant is zero, so that will go away. Precisely, just writing what I have uh, expressed verbally, if I compute g prime of x, this is the derivative of f plus c, so I apply my rules, the derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives, f prime plus the derivative of a constant, but I know by rules, so f prime of x plus zero, which is f of x, okay? So you see the steps? All the steps for the rules of derivatives I have been applying over here. The sum, the constant, the derivative of constant is zero, and I recover f prime, which was f by assumption. So I'm trying to make the distinction between big F and little f so that you're not confused. Um, conversely, mm -hmm. we can show that if f and g are both anti-derivatives 
of f, then what would happen is that g of x is equal to b f of x plus c for some constant c. Um, in the textbook, it's indicated that you have an exercise that's approved. We can just make a simple comment, which is the sketch of the proof, which is, okay, you have big F prime, which is equal to little f, which is equal to g prime by assumption, implies that when you put f minus g and you compute the derivative, this would be equal to zero. Just do the computation, right? f prime minus g prime is equal to f minus f, which is equal to zero. So f minus g is a constant. Well, sorry. Let me know when it doesn't appear, by the way. It's a constant function. I'm kind of like getting myself ahead on the game, but everybody knows that. Well, when the derivative is zero, what you have is a constant. And of course, this has an interpretation in terms of the slopes. Um, there is a big fuss made in the book about this, which I don't think it's that important because at this point, what you're saying is that if you have two functions whose derivative is the same, basically their difference is only a constant value. So that is clear. And then what they make the point about is that here you have the slope of this function big F, here you have the slope of the function G. They have the same slope, therefore when you consider the tangent, so the tangent lines of every point in the curve, they always have the same inclination, the same slope, Therefore, the difference is only a constant value, but that is clear from that. Because the difference is just a constant. It's clearly just the same function. It's just you add it or you are subtracted by a constant quantity. That's all, okay? So if you want to delve into the geometrical interpretation, you're more than welcome to check the book. I frankly think that the point is already stated here. So that's not an issue. And in any case, some comments are, are, are made on the notes if you want to have more info about that, um, but I don't think it's that important. Um, what you have now, just to make the summary, can I change uh, to a new page, is that okay? Okay. So, if you consider all the antiderivatives, of little f, what you have is actually a family of parallel curves, so basically vertical translations of each other. all characterized by the function big F of x plus c for a constant c. So this is related to what we just mentioned. Basically, what this is telling you is that all antiderivatives of little f can be characterized in this form. If you find a single antiderivative, all the antiderivatives are just that one when you add a constant, that's all. So once you have found one, the family is defined by adding, either adding or subtracting a constant value, okay? So the strategy is clear now. If I want to find an antiderivative, well, all the family, I just have to find one, and then I have the value, well, the value of C that I want, and I can generate all the antiderivatives. So, Notation is important, as you have seen in calculus, because there was a reason we introduced the Leibniz notation. And in integrals, it's also important for the following reason. Because when you express the family of antiderivatives, so I'm just making the point that this is notation. This antiderivative is denoted by the symbol, which is the integral of little f x dx, which is equal to, by what we have just said, to big F of x plus a constant c. And this has a name, so this is a convention, you have to learn it. This is the indefinite integral of little f of x. 
There is a reason which is indefinite, because C can take any value, any constant value. So it's not completely defined. What you have is something pretty convenient, because you have expressed all possible, all possible antiderivatives of little f by this. But since C can take any value, it's not completely defined. So again, the point is that it's indefinite, because the constant C can take any value. And then there is also a point to be made about all the notation that we are using right now. So let me write it. We have this symbol, which if you may not have seen before, this is the integral symbol. What does it look like to you? I'm curious. I'm going to say what it is related to, but please let me know. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, look, I'm trying to help you. I just want, of course, that everybody is able to see what is displayed here. So um, if I show you that symbol, what does it look like to you? An S, right? Well, yeah. Uh, it's like an old form of the S. Basically, when they invented the concept of integration, if you look at the definition, it's actually related to a sum. So. What we will see is that actually the integral is related to the area below the curve and the x-axis. But in order to define more refined the, the concept of integration, you have to do the limit of a sum. That's why you have that. So just to make some history, basically used to represent a sum. That's all. So there is a notation for the function f, little f, which is called the integrand. There is C, which is the so-called constant of, sure, constant of integration. And there is something new for you if you have not seen, if you have actually not seen the integral before, which is this dx. What does that mean, right? So at this point, it is true that it's notation. But again, the Leibniz notation is also appearing. <coughs> There's a reason for it. It has a name. It's called the differential. And it's important because it specifies x as a variable of integration, meaning that you are integrating with respect to the x variable. So what you're looking for is a function such that if this derivative is equal to little f, where f is a function of x. You might not see it as a big issue now, but when you have several functions defined, such as u and b, where u depends on x, etc., etc., it might be good to keep track of what the function is for. Okay? So this is just notation. And well, you would have something like 3x squared dx equal to x cubed plus c, which is similar to the exercise that we did. So this is the integral symbol. This is, well, it don't focus again. So this is the integrand. This is, well, what you have is that x is the variable of integration. And this is the constant of integration. This is just notation, and I'm really just emphasizing it because apparently there are some people who have not seen this before. So just get used to the notation and that's it. But the purpose is already clear. You want to find a function such that this derivative is equal to the other function you were given. Um, so again, if f is differentiable, the integral of f prime of x dx is equal to x plus c. Is this clear for everybody? Hmm? Yeah, that's, is there a question? I mean, this is what in logic they call a tautology. I mean, this is uh, obvious. I'm just repeating the concept that I define myself. Obviously, if I want to find a function such that its derivative is big F prime, it's F. When I take the derivative of F, I get F prime. It's clear. So all what I'm trying to say in this case, f prime of x 
is equal to little f, which is actually f prime of x. So I was given this one. Clearly, if I take the derivative, I recover f prime. Okay, so this is just the simplest problem in a way. And this is just by definition. So, and again, I think Leibniz notation will make the point obvious, given that you know this, of why this happens. So you have df dx in the Leibniz notation times the x integral equal to f of x plus c. Sure. So look at this for one second and think about what this is telling us. Here, think of the derivative as an operator. It's something that you apply to a function, right? Then you apply another operator, which is the integral. And you recover almost the function plus a constant. So there's a thing to make a point of, because let's think for the moment that the constant c is equal to 0. From this, it's clear that the derivative as an operator and the integral as an operator are inverse operators of each other. You apply the derivative, you apply the integral, you almost recover the function, except that you have some thing that is not determined yet, which is the constant of integration. But this is why people talk about why these are inverse operators of each other, okay? Of course, you, ha you cannot forget the constant of integration when you compute indefinite integrals, but what we want to make the point of is that the indefinite integral of the derivative of a function is the function itself plus a constant of integration. Okay? So that's why people talk about like these derivative and integrals being your inverse function uh, operators of each other. Um, it's a little bit more abstract, that is true, because usually you have functions with values, but in this case, the derivative and the integral, if you want to be more refined mathematically, are acting over the functions, not over numbers. But the concept is still the same. You almost recover the original function, but you have some indeterminacy, which is the constant. Now, I want to make the point that this is indicating that there is a relation sure, between, is it unfocusing or what's up? What's the deal? What is the limit? I'm, I'm really wondering because it seems to me that, okay, beyond the focusing, which is a pain in the ass today, um, <coughs> like, well, as far as I was told, there were some modifications to this classroom, and before it was visible for everybody, and after those modifications, there are issues of visibility. So that is kind of strange, but in any case, uh, let me know because apparently there are some issues with this classroom. So, there's a relation between the derivatives and indefinite integrals, which is precisely this relation that I wrote. And this also gives you like some tip on how to solve this problem, because if the derivative and the integral are inverse operators of each other, if you know the rules for derivatives, you can actually use that to construct rules of integration. Especially for simple cases like the constant, like the sum, etc., etc. So, can I continue? You can. We can establish some integration rules. by reversing analogous or analog differentiation rules.
So of course, we have some rules that you probably know, so it might sound like a refresher, but if you have not seen it, it's useful. So you have some rules. Sure. I see. For integrating common functions. <coughs> of course, what you have first is the constant rule, which is that the integral of a constant is equal, where the constant is k, is equal to kx plus c for a constant k. Then you have the power rule, where if you have a function equal to x to the n power, where n is not minus 1, and then you integrate it, so don't forget your dx, but you have is that this is equal to the ratio of x to the n plus 1 power divided by n plus 1 plus a constant for all values of n as long as they are not minus 1. I mean, here you can clearly see what the issue is. When n is minus 1, you would have a 0 in the denominator. But for that case, you actually have another rule, which is the log rule, which means that for precisely n equal to minus 1, which would be 1 over x, sure, the x, what you would have is natural log of absolute value of x plus a constant c for all x not 0. So the fact that we have the log of the absolute value um, lets us define the log for almost all the values of x, but we will still have the problem at zero. That's a singularity, right? <coughs> then what you have is the exponential rule, which, if you remember your functions, the integral of e k x dx is equal e k x divided by k plus c, where a constant k is not zero. So I would suggest you the following, because look, at this point you're familiar with the derivatives, um, with the rules for derivatives. So making you, in your mind the computation of what would happen when you take the derivative of this object and just realize that you will get the other one over here, okay? Derivative of kx, well, first of all, the constant disappears. That's why we have the constant of integration. Derivative of kx, you have the k. If you have that, then the factor of n plus 1 comes out, then you have minus 1, so you have x to the n. This one you have to do by cases. This one is also clear, because the derivative of the exponential, you have a factor of k, which goes out over here, and you would recover the original exponential. So there is only one case which actually requires to be detailed in the analysis, which is the log rule. And in that case, if x is greater than zero, what you know is that sure, is the absolute value of, yeah, thank you, um, of x is equal to x. And in that case, if you take the derivative with respect to x, of course, of natural log of absolute value of x, is actually the derivative with respect to x of natural log of x, which is one over x by the rules that we already know. On the other hand, if we have x negative, in that case, minus x is positive. And so natural log of the absolute value is the natural log of minus x. And in that case, if I were to do the computation for this other case of the derivative with respect to x of natural log of absolute value of x in this case is the derivative with respect to x of natural log of minus x by what, what I have done before. And here I would have the same function and then divided by its derivative, which is minus one. So I get the cancellation and I have again one over x as in this case, right? So we see that for both cases, we actually recover one over x, which is good, okay? Um, so we have considered all the cases for which x is not zero because the log is not defined for zero. So, sure, for all the values of x, not zero, derivative with respect to x of natural log of absolute value of x is equal to one over x, and which gives me the rule that I had before, right? So 
this is useful. It's the derivation of the rule that we have above. Um, the important thing is that with the log rule, we have all cases for the powers of n. If you think about it again, I'm just trying to emphasize that the previous power rule does not contain the case, uh, the case n equal minus one. One over x is precisely that other case, which we just proved. So we have the cases for all powers. And you also have some rules some algebraic rules for indefinite integration. So in this case, what you have is the so-called constant. Look, at this point, I think you have seen what is the strategy. You know the rules for derivatives and you are applying it for the integrals because they are inverse operators of each other, okay? So that's why, just because of the fact that they are somehow inverse operators, you kind of like know many of the rules of integration just by the properties of derivatives. That's, in a nutshell, what we're doing here, okay? So that will be applied again when we have the integral of a constant times a function, simply because the constant comes out Try to remember the rules of derivatives, and in this case, k is a constant. What you also have is something so-called the sum rule. Let's say I have the integral of a sum of two functions. I'm being careful, having the bracket, etc. And this is the integral. Well, the integral of the sum is the sum of the integrals. Integral of f dx plus integral of dx, again, because the derivatives have the same kind of rule. Then what you have is a difference rule. In a way, it follows from, as a consequence from the previous two, which is that if you have the subtraction of f minus g, I have the integral of f of x dx minus the integral of g of x dx. And well, again, I mean, look, we will do the proof for one of them, for the constant multiple. But I'm just doing the proof to try to emphasize how it follows from the rules of derivatives. So if I have that D capital F over dx is equal to little f of x, that means that the derivative with respect to x of k, where k is a constant, times big F of x is equal to k df dx, which was kf. So that is precisely the whole idea, right? We want to recover a function such that its derivative is k times f, which is what we got with this one, okay? So at this point, we have covered all the rules. We have a couple examples. Um, well, I know that you want your last two minutes. On the other hand, the material is on the book, okay? So if you're really in a rush, you can consult the book. That's not an issue. Um, again, my strategy, if I were you, I would read the book before I came to class. No, I'm not telling the people to go. You can do whatever you want, I don't care, but please don't make noise. It's just, it's not even annoying for me. Like literally I get like five people or 10 people who ask me, what did you say in the last two minutes? That's all, that's all what I care. It's not about m myself. It's about your classmates, have some empathy. So if you have exercise 5.1.4, where you have to find a function from its slope function, So you have to find f of x whose tangent has a slope 3x squared plus 1 and the graph passes through the point 2, 6 
what you know is that f prime of x is equal to 3x squared plus 1, which means that f of x is equal to the integral of f prime of x dx, which is the integral of 3x squared plus 1 dx. And if I do the computation, I have x cubed plus x plus c. So the second step would be how to find c. Try to study this problem. We will finish this in the next class, but we are pretty close to the end of this. Am I allowed to switch my math test because like um like I just